Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Empowerment Temple African Methodist Episcopal Church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I thank you for your patience, but I guarantee you're in for a great time tonight. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. All righty, all righty. What we're going to do is before we get started, if you don't mind, take a minute and invite a friend for this encounter because we're about to celebrate Black History Month. And we have an awesome speaker tonight. My goodness, my goodness. So if you don't mind contacting a friend, family, and let them know we're here through online services or they can come on down. And we're at the www etame.net. Yes, that's our website. And then there's Facebook Live. So we like to invite everyone to enjoy this encounter. Okay. But like I said, we're about to do our Black History Month celebration. And yes, we have an awesome speaker tonight, Dr. Umar Johnson. Can I get a clap? Yay! 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 And as we're about to get started, but what we're going to do is a short prayer. And I say short because I talk a lot. I'm Reverend Davis, and uh, I'm here on behalf of our pastor, Pastor Robert Richard Allen Turner, and our beautiful first family. Can we get a hand clap for them, please? Thank you. So if you don't mind standing, we'll do a prayer so that we can get our evening started. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, break up the bones a little bit, too. Amen. Let us bow our heads. Good and gracious Father, we come before you this evening to say thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to give you glory. Thank you for another opportunity on this earth. Thank you for another month called Black History Month, February the 1st, 2023. Because a lot of people didn't make it this far, God, but we're thankful for your many blessings. So this evening, God, the Holy Spirit is welcomed in this place. God, be with us tonight as we learn, we encounter, we enlighten. God, give us all those things that you have for us this evening. So we want to say thank you. We love you and bless you. Amen. Can we have a seat? And like I said, you're in for a great encounter. So enjoy. Thank you. Amen. And thank God for Reverend Davis. Give her a hand. We appreciate her welcoming you all. Um, uh, Bishop John Richard Bryan, can you please stand and let us recognize you? You are pillaring our community. I thank God for your legacy and your leadership. Um, I am happy glad on tonight, the first day of Black History Month, the first day of Black History Month. Um, most of us celebrate it year-round. As you can tell, if you walk through the hallway and saw that mural, the only place in the world you're going to see a mural of black history biblically and of the black church um, is right here. We pride ourselves in supporting and loving our people and loving our African identity. Members of the African Methodist Episcopal Church have been doing this since 1787, and I'm thankful tonight that we have the Prince of Pan-Africanism in the house. He has been a laborer for a long time in the vineyard. He's a trained clinical child psychologist. He is sought after the world around for his intelligence in making sure that our black children are not tracked. In fact, he has books out in the hallway. If you have not gotten a book of his, please do get one. If you are a member of any church or any organization, a mosque, a synagogue, or, or whatever, uh, make sure your organization has at least one copy of his book. The child you save may very well be your own. Um, there's also some other paraphernalia of his um, he is back in Baltimore, his first time at Empowerment Temple, and he is also in the process. Oh, that's another reason why I really respect the brother. He's not just talking about it. He's trying to be about it. He's starting a school, um, Frederick Douglass School, and, and we want to make sure that we support that endeavor. Um, we want to make sure that we support that endeavor. We want to make sure we support that endeavor. And so on tonight, on this, on this first day of Black History Month, um, he shared with me, Bishop, that he had never received any support from a black church in his endeavor in starting a school for black boys. And so that's shocking, right? 
Uh, he's never received any support. So we're going to change that tonight. We're going to change that tonight. And so if you, with your help and the officers of Empowerment Temple and whoever Dr. Umar Johnson has represent him, we want to stand now and ask you to come and give whatever God placed on your heart. This is a free event. You didn't pay a penny to get in. But we do want to support Dr. Johnson and his school on uh, whatever amount God places on your heart to do, uh, do so. If you were writing a check, make it out to F, what is it? I, I don't know if they have cash out. Um, where is B? Can you have her come out here? Um, F D M G. Um, and let me see his cash app. Um, I don't know if it's, it's um, but, uh, but we definitely will take cash. Um, before we had cash out, we had cash. So if y'all wanna <laughs> do that, it's B in the hallway, cause she knows his exact number. Um, she's at his table. Darnell, do you see a B out in the hallway? She knows the, um, I just got cash. Um, but as you all are preparing for that, we want to make sure that um, you know that we have vendors also in the hallway and that those vendors are looking forward to making sure you support them. They're all black-owned vendors. Uh, we have security here uh, as well. Um, and yes, B, right here. What is the... Uh, acronym for the school. Okay. What's the acronym for the school, though? Okay. Well, those who have cash, you all can come and give now, because I'm going to give my cash. Um, and the, you all technical card carrying people. Um, take your time. F D G M school. F D G M school. F D M G school. F D Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey School. That's right. Yes, sir. Two great men. Yes, sir. All right, we um, hope you all have, if you all have a check, F -M F -D -M -G, Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey School. And we're going to pray over the offering and ask God to multiply it and give it, make sure our young boys get the education they need to better their minds and their hearts. And we hope that this is a sign for many other churches to come it's time for us to put our money where our mouth is and to support other brothers in their endeavors in trying to make our community better. Um, this is all for helping, making sure his dream that matches our goals becomes a reality. God, we thank you for this offering, offering most high creator. We pray you bless it and multiply it and bless the man of God who is seeking to make this mission possible and plausible. Um, encourage him and keep him. In the holy, mighty, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank God. So we are now, if somebody can knock on the door and let them know we're ready. We are now about to be in for a treat. Um, Dr. Umar Johnson really does not need any introduction. Um, I need the introduction. For most of y'all, this is your first time seeing me. I'm Robert Turner, Passive Empowerment Temple. Um, not too long been here in Baltimore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm from originally Tuskegee, Alabama, the South, 
if y'all can't tell by now, um, I'm, I'm still learning how to eat crab meat and, and oh, use Old Bay seasoning and all of that stuff. We use Lawry's back in Alabama. And we, we know how to fry some catfish and some fried chicken. Um, but no, I love Baltimore here, this wonderful church, this dynamic church. We meet every Sunday at 930. And every month, every month, we march from Baltimore to the White House. We meet at Carroll Park on Route 1. This month, we're doing it on February 20th, President's Day. We march 40 miles for 40 acres and a mule. Reparations now. Uh, we, don't, we don't just talk about it over here. We, 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 we literally walk the walk. The walk. Um, and so if you all want to join us, uh, it's a long walk. If you can't do 40, do 30. If you can't do 30, do 20. If you can't do 20, do 10. If you can't do 10, do 5. If you can't do 5, do 3. If you can't do 3, do 2. If you can't do 2, do everybody can do 1 mile. You walk 1 mile in the mall. <laughs> but whatever you do, come meet us. And if you can't walk at all, just meet us on Route 1 and clap us on to victory. You know, just shout at us, that a boy. Just keep walking, Pastor. Keep walking. And it's nothing really right now. We only have black men doing it. We got black men every month. Every month. Every month. Every month. For our reparations, for our justice, what this country owes to our ancestors and to all black people. If you've been in this country two minutes, you've experienced racism. And, 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 and we believe that they owe us a check. And we're going to get our check. We're going to get your check. Make sure you get paid for not just slavery, but denial of the GI Bill that our uncles and granddaddies and grandmothers did not get, for redlining, for the race massacres of 1921 and, and 1919 and the Red Summers. We're going to get our check for police brutality. We, 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 they owe us. We built this nation. We built this, and we shouldn't let them forget it. You know, we should, you, you have bill collectors calling you today for stuff that you spent two, three dollars over the limit. They owe us two, three trillion. And we, and we ought to bug them just as much as your bill collectors bug you. <laughs> so good to see my Black Panther brothers here. Thank God for them. Pray, give the hand to the Panthers. Give a hand to the Black Panthers. New Black Panther Party. Um, but the fence, these brothers protected me when I was in Tulsa, and people wanted to kill me. They protected me. And I always will thank God for them. Thank God for them. Anyway, you see the man of the hour. Can we all stand on our feet? The Prince of Pan-Africanism, Dr. Umar Johnson, my teacher. Baltimore, make some noise. Where the black Baltimore, Maryland noise at, family? One time. Ashe, Ashe, black power. Put your hands together for Pastor Robert Vernon for letting us be in the AME. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Go ahead and take your seats, brothers and sisters. Sister Lola, let me get that bag from you. I want to time myself because I'm going to catch the Holy Ghost too and I don't want to go over. Yes, indeed, brothers and sisters. I have a special relationship with the African Methodist Episcopal Church for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm from Philadelphia, which is where the AME was founded by Richard Island. And I make it a point to drive by Mother Bethel AME as often as I can. And I was most recently at Richard Island's grave site. If you ever get a chance, next time you're in Philadelphia, and I'm putting together a tour, and I'm probably going to do this tour at the grand opening of the FDMG Academy community celebration. Okay? So for those who are interested, you're going to come to Philadelphia either the day before or the day after we celebrate FDMG in Wilmington, Delaware. But I want to take you to the oldest black cemetery in the country. 
And in that cemetery, Richard Island is interned. In that cemetery, Absalom Jones is interned. In that cemetery is also William Still, the brother who collected the largest narrative of escaped slave documentation. He's in there. I don't think Octavius Cato is there, but he might be. Several black Civil War veterans are buried there. It's the oldest black cemetery in the country, and we're going to visit that when we do the Philadelphia tour. So that's one connection to AME. Because as pastor will teach, Richard Island and Absalom Jones, before Marcus Garvey, founded an organization called the Free African Society. Now, this is important because a lot of you say you didn't come from Africa. That's the new self-hate fad in the black community, right? But they had the Free African Society, a self-help movement exclusively for black people more than 100 years before Marcus Garvey. It came from the AME. I got another AME connection. The seventh bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Bishop Wayman, is my four times great grand uncle. My three times great grandfather, George Washington Bailey, the cousin of Frederick Douglass and first black teacher in Denton, Maryland, married my grandmom, Annie Wayman, who's a niece of Bishop Alexander Wayman. So I have AME blood. I got one more connection. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who was called Marcus Garvey before Marcus Garvey, was an AME bishop. And it was my uncle, Bishop Wayman, who helped fight some of the AMEs because they thought Bishop Turner was too radical to be an AME bishop. Now, the AMEs are radical. So for them to feel that Bishop Turner was too radical, this is the black man who said God was black. Elijah Muhammad attended his school in Georgia. Marcus Garvey got that black God concept from Bishop Turner. Bishop Turner, one of the first black men elected to public office during Reconstruction. Bishop Turner, one of the first black leaders who had to travel with full-time security due to the amount of threats on his life. And Bishop Turner, who called the United States flag a stinking, dirty rag. So the AMEs got that history, brothers and sisters. And I need y'all to understand that for our first 200 years in America, for those of us who came on the ships, because I certainly did, we called ourselves Africans. The African Free School. All the churches was African. All the organizations was African. They didn't call themselves Native Americans. They didn't call themselves indigenous and aboriginals. They called themselves Africans. So brothers and sisters, I'm going to talk about four things tonight. Education, economics, politics, and black love. Let's start with education because we got a lot of parents in here. I got two phone calls this week from black mothers whose black sons were expelled from school for threatening harm that they had no way of carrying out. One of them was a preschooler, and the other one was a third grader. The preschooler told the teacher he was going to shoot her. He don't have no gun, can't even hold the gun, but because he's black and the teacher was white, for making the threat, he got expelled. The third grader said he was going to blow up the school because he was angry. No gun, no access to one. Parents probably don't even own a gun, but because he made the verbal threat, 
he got expelled from school for the rest of his childhood. Oh, yes. Black preschool boys lead the nation. They're the fastest growing group of expelled children. I'm going to say that again. Black preschool boys, three, four, five years old, are the fastest growing expulsion population in America. So my first lesson, I want every parent to hear me, mother, father, auntie, uncle, because we're all parents. In African culture, the children belong to the village, not the parents. The child comes through you. The child don't belong to you. I need us to get this because black people love to be private about their personal psychopathology. Black people love to be private about your personal psychopathology. What do you mean by that, Dr. Umar? I mean, if your daughter is a sex abuse survivor, you think you have a right to tell the neighborhood it's none of their business. If your son is out here robbing and killing for money, you think you have a right to tell the rest of the community it's none of their business. If you're keeping your children home, not sending them to school, and not even bothering to homeschool them, you think you have a right to tell the rest of us it's none of our business. It is all of our business. Why? Why is what goes on in your home important to everybody else in this auditorium. You know why? Because personal family problems become community crises. Did you hear what I just said? Personal family problems become community crises. Every brother in Baltimore right now stealing and killing. His issues started in his house. And the parents decided to keep it a secret. But once those children turn 18, 19, and 20, it's no longer a personal family issue. It's a community crisis. And that's why we have an African proverb that says the destruction of a nation begins in the homes of its people. I'm going to tell y'all the solution right now. Whether we're talking economics, family, spirituality, politics, education, the family, excuse me, the solution, we have to get back to the village. We haven't operated as a village in more than 150 years. The closest we were to a village, the last time we did it right, was the civil rights era the Black Panther, Black Power era of yesterday. That's the closest. But you know what's wrong with that analogy? It's the same thing that was wrong with the Black Wall Street analogy. The Tulsa, the Rosewood, the Wilmington. I just got an invitation today to go to Wilmington, North Carolina because they're about to memorialize their black Wall Street being destroyed. But you know what's wrong with those analogies? It took white people to mistreat us. It took white people to exclude us before we would do something for ourselves. I need y'all to understand something. Because everywhere I go, black people say, Dr. Umar, why we don't have a Tulsa today? when we have 20 times more money now than we had then. No Tulsa, no Rosewood, no Charleston, even though you got 20 times the money. You know why? White racism gave birth to Tulsa. White racism gave birth to Wilmington because you couldn't live with them. You couldn't send your children to their schools. You couldn't stay at their hotels. You couldn't eat at the restaurant. Necessity is the mother of invention. We needed a place of our own, and so we made it. But the white man knew something about us. He said, as successful as they are, 
they still have. Negroes in America still have, 403 years later, a need for approval from their oppressor. I want you to follow me, Baltimore. Do you, do, are y'all feeling me tonight? Make some noise. Is Baltimore in here tonight? Is black Baltimore in here tonight? The African American, if there is a such thing, is unique in revolutionary history. And the reason you are unique in revolutionary history is you are the only oppressed group to fight to defend their oppressor, but never fought the oppressor to get free himself. You are the reason he won the American Revolution. You are the reason he won the Civil War. You are the reason he won the War of 1812. You are the reason he won the Spanish-American War. No matter how poorly he treated you, you still found it within your heart to value his freedom more than your own. And so the world doesn't understand the American African because the world says, aren't you people worth $2 trillion a year? I mean, don't you single-handedly make entire companies into billion-dollar industries? Black women, I love you to death, but $30 billion on hair Nails and beauty products, I think, is a bit too much. Black women spend more money on hair and beauty than all other women put together. How do we explain that? Why does the black woman overspend on physical beauty? I'll tell you why. And we all know the answer. Because for four centuries, you've been told you were the ugliest thing on earth. And you've been trying to prove to yourself that what the white man has said about you ain't true. Well, I got news for you, black sister. Beauty has nothing to do with what you look like in that mirror. Beauty has everything to do with what you feel like inside. Any person who needs another race to validate your beauty will forever think they're unattractive. I was in Miami the other night on an interview for a podcast. And one of my Jamaican sisters, she asked the question. She said, I don't understand. This is night before last. I don't understand why you so worried about the little girls who are going to come to your school, how their hair are done. I don't know why you're worried about whether or not your teachers, because I know a few sisters who might want to teach, but they're not going to wear that. And I told her, then they can't work here. This is a 100% nappy by nature institution. No weave, no perm, no European hair color, no straightening comb. No Indian hair, no horse hair, no dog hair. Only your hair. We are the first school in American history, and I'm proud to say it. We are the first school in American history, and I'm proud to say it. Yeah, we got African-centered charter schools, but none of them took the stand I'm taking. We got African-centered independent schools, but none of them took the stand that I'm taking. If your daughter can't come to class in the original image of the divine mother, if your daughter has to come to my school looking like anything other than what God made her to be, you need to find her another school building. Because the first thing I got to teach black girls at the Anna Douglas Amy Garvey Academy the first thing I got to teach black girls is how to love themselves as they are. 
And how can a black woman be a teacher at the ADAG Academy of FDMG? How can a black woman be a teacher if I need the black girl to love herself as she is and she looking up at you with a blonde weave? Is that not a contradiction? Before I teach the black woman anything, I got to teach her to love herself. See, the white man has weaponized beauty against our sisters. And the white man has weaponized employment against our brothers. It is the black man's inability to earn. And it is the black woman's insecurity of appearance that are the primary weapons used in this country and around the world when it comes to black people. I don't care where I go at in the world, and I've been everywhere except Australia, there's four things I'm going to see. If I'm in Paris, France, if I'm in Austria, if I'm in London, if I'm in South America, if I'm in Jamaica, if I'm in St. Thomas, St. Croix, Bahamas, Bermuda, wherever I've been, Canada, China, Japan, there's four things where black people are. And I need you to know this because sometimes we can think we're so unique in the world because you fail to understand that what, what racism does to any black group, they do it to all black groups. Number one, Black women strung out on beauty products. I don't care where you go in the world, the black woman is overspending her disposable income to improve her self-concept of European beauty. I don't care where you go in the world, black men are over-incarcerated because they can't find livable wage jobs. I don't care where you go, any black community on earth, I don't care if they speak Spanish, English, Portuguese, Zulu, Igbo, no matter where you go in the world, Jesus is still white. And you know what's funny? Or not so funny? The blacker the country, the whiter the Jesus. When did we get that painting that's so famous? The most famous version of the white Christ was Leonardo da Vinci, 1482. We're 500 years later, and the white Jesus is still the most popular picture in the black community. I go into homes and do therapy. And when I go into homes and do therapy, I'm always looking for the bookshelf. And you know what I find, Baltimore, and I've been in a lot of your homes too, just like Philly, just like New York, just like everywhere. I can count on one hand the amount of black homes I've been in that had a bookshelf. There's a laptop, there's tablets, there's cell phone, there's perm juice, there's Air Jordans, there's blunt wrappers, there's an HD TV, no books, but guess what's on the wall? White Jesus. Why is the white image of Christ so dangerous? We know Christ was an African. Christ was blue, black, purple. And if you don't believe me, go to Egypt, go to the British Museum, go to New York City, take a trip to the Vatican in Rome and ask to see the statues of Jesus in the basement of the Vatican. And Jesus looks like you. Not Barack Obama, like you. Okay? Jesus Christ didn't look like an Arab. He looked like an African. In the oldest picture, I have a copy of him and the 12 disciples. Everybody's blue, black, purple, and nappy. So we know what color Jesus was. So why are black people so comfortable worshiping our deity in an image that resembles the enemy? Nobody else does that. In China, Jesus looks Chinese. I've been there. In Japan, Jesus looks Japanese. I've been there. But when I come to the black community, Jesus looks like the president. 
and the reason you're comfortable with your deity being represented by your enemy is because you are one and the same psychologically with your oppressor. We have internalized the racism. And until we admit we have internalized the racism, we will never fix this problem. Because we keep talking about the enemy outside of us. The enemy outside of me. The enemy outside of you. But I'm here to tell you right now, you can destroy racism in America all day long. But if the cracker that's written space in your mind is not done away with, he will just come back and reinvent himself through us. It's the internal white man that's our problem. It's the internal white woman that's our problem. Every black woman has a white girl inside of her. Every black man has a white boy inside of him. And until you admit that you have this spiritual cancer, you will never, ever redeem yourself. And I'm here to tell you tonight, Baltimore, that one of the things we have to do as a people and pastor would agree. We have to reconnect, reassemble, remerge the color of our skin as an aspect of our divinity. I need you to hear me really well. And a lot of you are not going to understand it. It's going to go over your head because most of us have been raised on a steady diet of colorblind multiculturalism. Black people are the only colorblind people in the state of Maryland. The Chinese in Maryland are not colorblind. The East Indians in Maryland are not colorblind. The European Jews in Maryland are not colorblind. The Irish, the Italians, the Chinese, the only group in this country that practices multiculturalism is the American Negro. And the reason you are so multicultural has nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Christ. It's a self-hate thing that has you begging and wishing for approval from other races. You want to be validated. You want to be appreciated. You want to be needed. You want to belong. And you are willing to let your children be miseducated for it. You are willing to let your men be mass incarcerated for it. You are willing to let your black single mothers struggle and die raising all them kids on their own just so you can get a seat at your slave master's table. Until you kill the need to be approved of by white folks, don't you call yourself a devotee of Christ. Because if you need the white man's validation in order to feel whole, then the white man just became your God, not Christ. Listen, I am not a black supremacist. I do not teach that we are better than anybody. I have no need for a little white girl to believe she's less attractive than my black daughter. I have no need for a little Chinese boy to think he's inferior to our black sons. I have no need for that. But I do believe in the truth. And when I study spiritual history, I can't help but notice Every prophet that God sent to this planet, every single one, including Buddha, including Krishna, every single prophet looked like me. So if I am not in some way a reflection of divine cosmic power, then who else could be? Brothers and sisters, the color of your skin is not a color. It is a chemical. And that chemical, that melanin that gives our skin the beautiful assortment of browns and golds that we have, 
This chemical is a God chemical. It is because you are melanated that you are able to experience spiritual ecstasies that no other group could even dream of. Stop taking your blackness out of your religion. Stop taking your blackness out of your spirituality. Stop taking your blackness out of your relationship with God. Do you not know when you don't give expression to the cosmic color of your skin? When you don't give expression to the cosmic color of your skin, when you don't say, I love being black. When you don't say, I appreciate the way God me, God made me. When you don't say, no mistake was made when I was brought forth. If you can't say that, you're suppressing the active intelligence of divine design. Part of our solution as a race is we have to restore blackness to its proper place in the divine order. Isn't it funny? They tell us black is ugly, but every time you go to court, the judge got on a black robe. Isn't it funny? They tell you black is ugly, but when you graduate from high school, you got on a black robe. When you get your PhD, you got on a black robe. When you come to church, he has on a black robe. If black is so ugly, why are the most prestigious men in the world always draped in black before they come before the people. Blackness is divine. And until you stop cutting yourself off from your color, God will continue to cut himself off from us. Do you think it's a coincidence we on the bottom? You think it's a coincidence we on the bottom? Let me explain something to you, my Maryland family. We always talk about one God, and there is only one God. But guess what? If it is above as it is below, if it shall be below as it is above, if God is one and God made us, and God made us first. If the purpose of life is to establish heaven on earth, if there's one God in heaven, all black people must become one to activate God consciousness on earth. The point that I'm making, the reason Baltimore suffers and New York suffers, and Dallas suffers, and Oakland suffers, and Minneapolis and Memphis suffers, is because we don't operate as one yet. Until we achieve oneness. See, we love talking about one God, but when are we going to operate in oneness? When are we going to function in oneness? When are we going to unite? In oneness. Many of you played sports as a child. All of you have belonged to an organization before. Have you ever noticed that if you belong to a church and you've been praying by yourself, when you link up with the rest of the congregation and everybody establishes oneness and y'all pray as a one, there's a different energy in that prayer. If you play football, when you get in the locker room with your team and y'all start chanting and getting hyped for the game, it's a different energy. For those of you who belong to the Divine Nine, black, Greek fraternities and sororities, some of you join white ones because you hate yourself, but you know when it's time for the step show and all your Delta sisters walk in, all your AKA sisters walk in, all your SG Row sisters walk in, all your Z5B sisters walk in, your Q brothers come in, your Kappa brothers come in, your Alpha and Sigma and Iota brothers come. When y'all come together as one and put all your petty stuff to the side and say for this step show, for this conference, for this fundraiser, for this building fund, we're going to put all our differences to the side and operate 
as a single unit, there's a divine power that takes over. So if, if God can do that for a football team, if God can do that for a single church, if God can do that for your sorority or fraternity, imagine what God will do when all of black Maryland decides to stand together as a single unit. Oneness is the goal. Some of y'all losing faith in the most high God. Y'all say, I've been praying, Doc. God ain't answered me yet. I've been on my knees every night, Dr. Umar. If, if there's a God, why God ain't answer me? Well, there's three answers to that. Answer number one, God never responds to a dishonest petition. Some of us are asking for things we have no business wanting in the first place. Number two, God doesn't respond to the selfish. If you've done nothing for nobody lately, why would the creator do something for you? As above, so below. And the third reason many of our prayers never reach the gates of the Most High is because black people, as much as we want to be free, as poorly as we have been treated, guess what? We still haven't learned that the white man's way ain't the right way. Some of you want to be free to imitate the white man. Some of you want to be free to become a black capitalist instead of a white capitalist. In other words, God is not going to put us back on the throne as his original children. God will not put black people back on the throne as his original children until you stop imitating your oppressor. Until you reclaim your God-given African divinity. As long as you want to imitate a defunct European capitalism, stop praying because you're wasting your time. You will never get that blessing until you decide to live and establish righteousness. See, we don't like to talk about righteousness, but God expects righteousness from black people. And until God gets righteousness, I don't care what your religion is, Muslim, Christian, Hebrew, Jehovah Witness, African traditionalism, Catholic, I don't care what path you take. Understand, you will not reach the goal unless you walk a path of righteousness. Yeah, we sin, but get back up and do it right the next time. You so used to cheating and sneaking that you think you can cheat and sneak the Lord. It ain't going to work that way, brothers and sisters. Do it right or don't do it at all. Let's talk about this miseducation machine. Parents, listen to me. ADHD is a scam. ADHD is a fraud. ADHD is a Wall Street drug hustle. We get attention deficit disorder in 1980. The American Psychiatric Association was paid by the drug companies to create something that don't even exist, attention deficit disorder. Seven years later, in 1987, they added the holy H, and ADD became ADHD. Why did they add the H? Because there's no drug that can make your child pay attention. There's no drug that can make your child pay attention. Ritalin can't make them pay attention. Adderall can't make them pay attention. Metadate can't make them pay attention. Concerta can't make them pay attention. So the drug companies were losing money on the ADD. The only thing the drugs can do is slow down the brain. So they said, we're going to have to make all the kids hyperactive, even if they're not, to justify medication. And why did they give us ADD in 1980? Because that's the same year the CIA dropped off crack cocaine in the black community. 
They started drugging the children and drugging the adults the same year. And I'm going to tell you a little secret, Baltimore County, but you're not going to listen. Because I've learned black parents don't listen to black psychologists unless you can find a white one to say the same thing. You know how many black parents are told to do things a certain way? But because the white folks said do it another way, they went with the white folks. And then they come back to me later. Dr. Umar, will you help me now? No, I won't. Because I already told you what to do, but you took them over me, so stay with them. Listen, if you don't plan on medicating your child, there's no reason to get an ADHD evaluation. Let me say it again. If you don't plan on giving your child Ritalin, which is synthesized cocaine, if you don't plan on giving your child Concerta, which is synthesized cocaine, if you don't plan on giving your child Metadate, synthesized cocaine, then why get him evaluated in the first place? Let me tell you what's going to happen if you get your child evaluated. The evaluation is the hook that forces the dope. Let me say it again. The evaluation is the hook that forces the dope. See, before you let your son get tested at We Hate Black People Charter School, Baltimore, Maryland. We Hate Black Boys Middle School, Baltimore, Maryland. We Can't Stand Black Girls High School, Baltimore, Maryland. Before you got them tested, the school couldn't force no dope. But the minute you go to the psychiatrist, psychologist, and get him diagnosed, now he has a psychiatric illness. And although you can't see ADHD, can't smell ADHD, ain't no blood test for ADHD, ain't no urine sample for ADHD, ain't no x-ray for ADHD, ain't no MRI for ADHD, even though you can't see it, touch it, take a picture of it, smell it, or weigh it, they will treat it like a real disease. And when you tell the teacher, I'm not putting my son on that medicine because I saw what it did to my other child, they're going to call Baltimore County Child Protective Services. And Child Protective Services is going to send a social worker out to your house. And you're going to start saying, I should have listened to Dr. Umar when he was at Empowerment Temple. Because guess what they're going to tell you? You are going to give that child medication. And you're going to give them the dosage that the doctor prescribed. And if we find out that you're withholding the medication, we're going to come back and charge you with medical neglect. And when you get charged with medical neglect, black Maryland parents, they don't just take Raheem out your house. They take all your children out your house. So you had four babies. Now you have zero. Because you let Raheem get tested when Dr. Umar said don't do it. And once he get tested, they can now force the meds because he has a quote unquote invisible illness. And then when you don't medicate, they can confiscate the kids. When you don't medicate, they can confiscate the kids. And guess who they're going to send all your black children to? The white rainbow community. No disrespect. Your identity is your business. But guess what? Most of us would rather not raise our children that way. But when you don't give them the ADHD medication, they're going to take your children and send them to a white rainbow family. You don't believe me? Go do your research. What group of people is most likely to end up with young foster children, white homosexuals and lesbians? Go do the research. They're the ones raising our children. I just read an article last week. A rainbow couple was foster parenting two or three black kids. They sexually abused them. I'm not going to say everybody would do this, but it happened. They sexually abused both black boys, and then they sold them out to be raped by others. 
This was last week's news. And black people, before you start ooing and eyeing and acting like you care about black kids so much, if we love our own so much, can somebody tell me why black people have the lowest intra-rate foster care placement percentage? Do you know we're the least likely to foster our own black kids? And you wonder why they on the streets killing each other? How are they going to show love when they ain't never felt love? Do you remember when you was a child, for those of you over 40, remember if Mike Mike's mom was out on the corner turning tricks or if John John's dad got locked up for selling bricks? Your mama, your grandmama, somebody would go get the kids out the house. They didn't call DHS. They didn't call the social worker. They didn't call the police. They said, get your school books. Get your clothes. I don't know where your mother at. I don't know when she coming back. I don't know where your father at. I don't know when he coming back. But I want you to know something right now. Until they come back, and if they never come back, you are part of my family now. How many of us was raised by black parents who refused to give up on children that they did not birth themselves? You know how many of us made it through life because another family cared? The school never knew. Your parents was nowhere around. When report card conferences came, Miss Nana stood in. When the school trip came up, Mr. Johnny paid for that school trip. And the white folks was like, when are we going to see their parents? They're working. We got this. And the next thing you know, you didn't graduate and nobody knew that you was without your biologicals for most of your life. When are we going to get back to the village, Black Baltimore? I know one thing. Children don't kill people who care about them. Children kill strangers. When I'm training teachers in the school, you know, the white teachers and some of the black coonish teachers. <laughs> Most black teachers are wonderful, but some of them are some damn coons. And they say, Dr. Umar, what am I supposed to do? He's cursing me out. He's throwing the desk. Have you ever had a face-to-face, one-on-one meeting with that young man? But I don't really have time. I didn't ask you if you had time. You're complaining about how uncontrolled he is. Have you ever sat him down and had a respectable dialogue for five minutes? Did you ever make a connection with that boy? That's why it's so easy for him to disrespect you. That's why it's so easy for him to destroy your classroom because there's no connection for respect. Let me tell you a little secret. If you take out five minutes of your day, sit down with that young man, give him an apple, give him a banana, and laugh and joke, ask him about his life, his home, tell him how much you believe in him, he may never get suspended another day in your class. But you know what the problem with public school in Baltimore is? Public school teachers think they're college professors now. What do I mean when I say public school teachers think they're college professors? For those of you who teach college, you understand that you're not expected to have a relationship with your college students. You're not expected to care personally about your college students. You're not expected to ask them about their home life. It's a business relationship. You pay for a class, I teach. If you don't like the way I teach, that's too bad. If you don't like how low my voice is, that's too bad. If I'm moving too quickly through the syllabus, that's too bad. But grade school is not supposed to be that way. In grade school, the teacher is supposed to cater to the needs of the child. They don't do that no more because they don't care about the black children. And guess what? Our black parents aren't too much different yourselves. See, 
Black children don't drop out of school until black parents stop dropping into school. Show me a black kid who dropped out, I'll show you a black parent who never dropped in. If a black child got a good teacher and a horrible parent, he will still make it. If you got a good parent and a horrible teacher, you will still make it. If you have a great parent and a great teacher, you will make it. But if you have a horrible teacher and a disconcerned parent, you guaranteed to fail. And that's what's wrong with so many black children. We got teachers who don't care and parents who couldn't care less. And that's why if I was in charge of education, I wish I could be U.S. Secretary of Education for one year. Joe Biden, you crazy old geezer. Give me the Secretariat of Education for one year. Let me tell you what I would do, y'all, if I was in charge. Because the white folks down the street in D.C., they keep acting like they don't know how to fix this. So let me tell you how they can change the whole thing in a year. First thing I'm going to do, the percentage of black teachers in a school will be identical to or greater than the percentage of black children in the school. No school in America. Will you have mostly black kids and mostly white teachers? Hell no! And then some of y'all saying, well, what color got the... See, you still cooning. <laughs> what color? I'm a... What color? If a teacher can teach, a teacher can teach. Let me explode that myth on three grounds. Let's go to the research. Because y'all don't listen to me, but y'all will listen to some white research! According to the white research, teachers pay more attention to children who look like their own. So if teachers pay more attention to the children who look like their own, if your son and daughter don't look like Steph Curry, they might not get no attention. No disrespect to my light-skinned Africans, we one family. I'm just saying that how when white folks are involved, there's a color hierarchy at play. And the reason why a lot of the black boys are struggling is because their skin is too dark and their hair is too nappy. You don't believe me? Walk into any school in Baltimore that offers a mentally gifted program. I want you to go look at the color of the mentally gifted students. Then I want you to go down the hall to the emotionally disturbed class. Look at the color of the students in the emotionally disturbed class. I've never been to a school in my life where the emotionally disturbed students were in at least five shades darker than the mentally gifted students. Teachers care about black kids who look like white kids. And sometimes they don't even get the love. Number two, the most predictive factor on a child's success in school is not poverty, is not their parents being married, is not whether they qualify for free or reduced lunch, is not how much money the school gets or the teacher's salary. The number one factor that influences academic achievement is how much does the teacher believe in the children. Did y'all hear what I just said? Teacher belief will manifest itself in the classroom. You wonder why black kids is failing, because you got white people in charge. And I'm not going to beat up on the white women. I'm not going to disrespect the snow bunnies. And I'm going to get to you Negroes who like dating snow bunnies in a minute. I'm going to get to you in one minute. See, I'm trying to understand. With all the problems that black Baltimore got, we got police brutality. Rest in peace to Freddie Gray. We got unemployed black folks. We got poverty in Baltimore. We got gentrification in Baltimore. We got economic apartheid in Baltimore. 
And with all these problems we fighting racism through, you Negroes still found time in the middle of a war to go snow bunny shopping. How in the hell would all our kids be miseducated? How in the hell all these black boys with no daddy? How all these single mothers raising multiple kids? How does the black man find time to go snow bunny shopping? And the reason you want the white woman is because your low self-esteem your racial self-hatred, your animosity towards your mother's womb has forced you to seek approval from the very woman who was responsible for our women being beat, raped, and sold off on the plantation. And some of you coons think that the white woman who sleeps with the black man is less racist than the white women who don't. There is no difference between a jungle fever snow bunny or an all Caucasoid snow bunny. They all racist. And you know what really upsets me when I see a brother with a bunny? When I'm walking through the airport and I see a brother with a bunny, if there's a black woman walking anywhere near him and his European queen, right? Have you sisters noticed? He will go out of his way to ignore your existence. Black women, have you seen this? He won't even look in the direction of the woman who gave him his life. I see it all day long. He got to prove to this white woman that she's the greatest thing on earth until you end up like Tiger Woods. <laughs> Tiger Woods Snow Bunny was a house servant. She's a billionaire now, because he went and got him some African cookies. And because he went home to Africa, he lost half of his money. Look at Bill Cosby, my North Philadelphia elder, Shane. He thought because he was so rich and famous, he can do what white rich and famous men can do. He started sampling cookies all over the city. <laughs> Irish cookies, Italian cookies. And then Bill Cosby all of a sudden decides he wants to buy a major network. And they say, we can't have that. Call up them white girls. And then the second largest oil company in the world found out Bill Cosby had oil under his Massachusetts home. And they said, Bill and Camille, can we drill? They said, no. And then Bill and Camille organized all the homeowners, black and white, in their community, don't let them drill. And the white man said, I got to get this oil. Cosby won't give me the oil. So they went and found all the snow bunnies. And they had a snow bunny conference on Bill Cosby. And they said, all you nasty, crusty, wrinkly bunnies are going to publicly say he attacked and assaulted you. I don't care what you say, and I don't trivialize violence against women because black women are the worst victims of it. I want to be clear, but you're not going to convince me. Bill Cosby, the number one television personality, black, in the world at the time, sexually assaults you, sexually harasses you, sexually offends you. He's the number one television star in the country, the first black man to have his own miniseries on TV, paved the way for the greatest comedian of all time, Richard Pryor. Bill Cosby was Denzel on steroids back in the 70s and 80s. And he harasses all these white women who benefit from snow bunny privilege. And they don't say a word, not a whisper. They wait 30, 40 years 
till they old and nasty looking. And once they get three chins, they want to go public and tell the world, Cosby assaulted me 40 years ago. You out your mind. That was nothing but the drug company. You think R. Kelly in jail for touching children? You don't think the music company knew about R. Kelly's unhealthy sexual fantasies? That ain't why R. Kelly in jail. He might should be, but that ain't why he's in there. R. Kelly doesn't get locked up and still, until he starts questioning ownership of his master recordings. R. Kelly don't get locked up until he hears some of his unpublished music on the radio that he never authorized. R. Kelly don't get locked up until Sony Records ends up with a part of his catalog that he never signed away. The pedophilia was the cover. The real reason was the music. Why is Whitney Houston dead? You think it's because of drugs? The coroner said Whitney Houston's body was in water so hot. The water was so hot that no human being could force themselves to remain submerged in it. That's the coroner. So if the coroner said Whitney Houston could not have stayed in that bathtub on her own free will, that means somebody helped her drown. And can somebody tell me why the Beverly Hills Hilton, one of the most popular hotels in the world, never reviewed the hallway video footage that would show us exactly who walked into the room? Who is that powerful that they can make the Beverly Hills Hilton eliminate the video footage? You know why Whitney Houston was murdered. Because she was going broke. And what do most popular artists do when they start going broke? They say, we got to take a look at three things. My royalties, my publishing, and my master recordings. And there was somebody whose name I'm not going to mention because I got to get home tonight. <laughs> I got a school to open. All you got to do is ask yourself. Who benefited the most from Whitney Houston being dead? Who was having a party that night? And even after Whitney Houston died, he did not cancel the party. The party went on in Whitney Houston's death. And even Shaka Khan! We are in the house of the Lord. But I must say, if I could marry me one queen mother, it would be Shaka Khan. Lord have mercy. Five, five! Thick in the thighs. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord! But it's something about that woman. I don't know what it is about Shaka Khan, brothers and sisters, but she makes my soul stir when I see that woman. But getting back to the point, we must stay focused, brothers. Lord help me. Shaka Khan said, Shaka Khan said, who in they right mind continues with a party when your number one artist just died upstairs in a tub? Y'all think Michael Jackson died from an overdose? Do you know Michael Jackson owned 50% of Sony records? Michael Jackson owned the Beatles catalog which made him 50% owner of Sony Records. Sony Records said, oh, no way. We can't let a Negro own half of this, even if he's the number one selling artist of all time. So Michael Jackson's album, Invincible, comes out. And what does Sony do? They give him no promotion. They sabotage Invincible to make sure Michael Jackson goes into debt. And then they come back to Michael and say, you're in debt, Michael. You owe us a couple mil. Give us the Beatles music. Michael says, no. I'm going to have a concert 
raise the money to pay y'all off. You're never getting the catalog. Michael Jackson made one mistake. He was living in Dubai with his brother. He decided to come back to the Staples Center to perform. Fatal mistake. Mike should have stayed over there until the concerts was done. He came back to L.A. They sent Conrad World, not World, the brother who murdered him. I forget his name, the black doctor. Conrad Murray. I think he did, what, five years? He's home, and he will be comfortable for the rest of his life for keeping his mouth shut. Prince! Why did they murder the prince? You know why they murdered the prince? Prince is one of the first artists after Sam Cooke to say, I want to own my own masters. And they said, Prince... We know you want your masters. This is what we're going to do. If you let us remaster the 25th anniversary Purple Rain album, just let us remaster and republish Purple Rain, we're going to give you your masters. Right after Prince gets his masters, he's dead. You know why Prince is dead? Because they want the unpublished music that Prince wasn't going to give them. Oh, yeah. Prince had more music that he never published than he published just like Tupac Shakur. Dead artists make more money. Jimi Hendrix, greatest guitarist of all time, died in a tub just like Whitney. What did we find out about Jimi Hendrix? His music manager was MI6, British intelligence. Jimi Hendrix wanted to finance the Black Panther Party with his monies. MI6 told the FBI they ordered Jimi Hendrix's death, died the same way Whitney did. Why are all of our celebrities dying in hotel rooms by themselves? Sam Cooke, the first major artist to own his own music, close friends with Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali. Sam Cooke tells Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that the minute y'all start fighting and work together, I'm going to finance the whole civil rights movement. Malcolm was going to lead the North. Dr. King was going to lead the South. And J. Edgar Hoover had a heart attack. They said, you want to kill Sam Cooke because he is not going to finance civil rights. Sam Cook dies about seven weeks before Malcolm. Never believe what the movie and the music and the news is telling you. The truth is always somewhere else, and the truth is always something else. Let me get back to my parents for a minute, and then I want to move on. I want to give every black parent here tonight five things that you better listen to. Listen to me when I tell you these five things. Number one, never sign paperwork that you don't understand. I'm going to give you my personal cell phone number. If any parent in the state of Maryland has an issue with your child, you can call Dr. Umar, and we can schedule a consultation. So no more excuses after tonight. 2023 is going to be a new year for black kids, and you're going to start fighting for my little brothers and sisters. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? No more dumb black parent syndrome. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. No more, because you're going to have my personal cell number. You got your own personal school psychologist. No more. Don't sign it if you don't understand it. If you don't understand it, take a picture of it, text it to me. Dr. Umar, I got this letter from the school. I don't understand what this is saying. Can you make it make sense? Don't sign it. Tell them I'm going to take it home. Read it over with my son's father. They're going to tell you we need it today. And you're going to tell them, I'm a parent. I don't have deadlines. You'll get it when I'm ready. Did y'all hear what I said, parents? Stop letting the school make you think you got timelines. You don't have timelines. They have timelines. Well, we really need this back by Friday. Well, if you need it this Friday, I should have had it Monday. Don't you ever sign nothing on the spot. Never sign on the spot is disrespectful and insulting. They do not make white parents sign on the spot. White parents, they put it in the envelope, put it in a child's book bag, they sit at home. Black parents, they catch you running into school. Can you just sign this real quick? You ain't got to read it. What black parent is going to sign anything without reading it? You tell them, I'm taking it with me, but we need it right now. Too bad. Next time, give it to me a week early. Teach them how to respect you. So number one, don't sign. Number two, don't go to any school meetings by yourself. Not the charter school, not the public school, not the Catholic school, not the private school. Do not go alone. Black mother, take your sister. Take your cousin. Take your girlfriend. Black father, take your brother. 
take your nephew. Have somebody who can serve as a witness in case you need to sue them. Have you ever noticed when you come to a school meeting, it's 20 white people and Negroes and one black mother in Baltimore. We want to talk about John John's behavior. You show up at We Hate Black Boys Elementary Charter. One black mother, you in the room, 20 people come in there. For you, you got the principal, the vice principal, the principal intern, the dean of students, the nurse, the social worker, school psychologist, school counselor, math leader, grade teacher, bus driver, trash man, window washer. Why did they bring 20 people in a meeting for one black mother? Why did they bring 10 people in a meeting for one black father? Two reasons. Number one, intimidate you. Intimidation. You feel so uncomfortable. They want him in special ed. You so uncomfortable, so nervous. You going to sign permission for special ed just to get the hell out of that lynching. That's why you don't go by yourself. Take somebody with you. And you know what I would do if I was you? I would bring as many people as they bring. I would go get the weed boy, Tay-Tay. Tay-Tay, I got a meeting about your nephew. The white folks keep ganging up. I need you and 10 corner boys. Wife beaters, tattoos, and you must smell like the strongest weed in Maryland. The meeting is at 1045 at Tay-Tay. I'm going to text you by 11 a.m., a number. The number I text you is the number of white folks and coons in here. So you text him 10. Tay-Tay gonna come in here with 20 corner boys, pants sagging, Tim's dragging, tattoos on their neck, cornrows, smelling like every kind of weed you can smell like. They walk in that room, alpha male, hard. Just got out five years. And you tell Tay-Tay, don't smile, mean mug, but don't talk. Do not talk, just mean mug. And then you look back over at the white people. This is Tay-Tay's uncles. These are his cousins. That's his godfather. What were you saying about ADHD medicine again? I am so sorry. Oh. I forgot. It's not Tay-Tay with the problem. It's Ty Mir. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Would you like a latte? Bring you some strong black men in that meeting. And everything they talked about will go away. Best case scenario, mother and father should show up together. If you can't get the father, get a man. Black man, you need a woman to balance the energy. Because guess what they do with the black man? You go in there by yourself, you're not scared, you're not intimidated. But that's the problem. Because now when you raise your voice and you tell that white woman, I was on Ritalin, I was on Metadate, I was on Concerta. I know what it did to me. I lost weight, couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. I had nightmares, tick disorders, autistic symptoms. My son ain't taking that crack. Well, I really think you should reconsider. I told you. My son ain't taking that crack. But sir, but nothing. And once that African base come out, you know what the white girl gonna do? She gonna pull the whole, uh, 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 what they call it, Karen energy. Her back gonna give out. Her heart gonna stop beating. The veins gonna pop out. And she gonna go tell the principal, he got aggressive and I don't feel comfortable no more. I can't do my job. I think I'm traumatized. And now you got a restraining order, black man. You got a restraining order. You can't come to school for back to school night. You can't come to school to get a report card. You can't go on a class trip. You can't go to report card conferences because you didn't listen to Dr. Umar when I said, take somebody with you. Number three, do not get any children evaluated. Do not get any children evaluated, not psychologically, not academically. No clinical evaluations, no special ed evaluations, 
under the fourth grade unless it is speech, deafness, blindness, brain injury, or orthopedic impairment. You do not get a reading disability evaluation for a six-year-old kindergartner. Are you Negroes crazy? I'm trying to understand why I'm finding all these black boys in special ed kindergarten a reading disability in kindergarten. How can you have a reading disability in kindergarten when you just started learning how to read? Christmas was two months ago. Excuse me. It was January 31st. Christmas was last month. How many of you, excuse me, February 1st, I missed it by a day. <laughs> How many of you bought books for Christmas? How many of you bought a set of encyclopedia for Christmas? How many of you bought a dictionary for Christmas? How many of you bought a thesaurus for Christmas? Most black boys are in special ed for what? Reading. Not autism, not speech, not deaf, not vision, not hearing, not orthopedics, not health problems. Most black boys are for reading. And you know why? We don't make them read outside of school. Shame on you. I heard they closing down libraries in Baltimore because y'all don't use them. Can somebody help me understand? Black boys in Baltimore are reading two grades below their current class. So if black boys in Baltimore are reading two grades below their class, how are the libraries suffering from under usage? See that? See that? See, we can talk about racism in school, but what about self-hate in the black household? If you ain't got no reading material in your house, that ain't no house. That's a waiting cell for future incarceration. Can I ask you a question? When the United States Congress outlawed the slave trade in 1808, when the United States Congress outlawed the slave trade in 1808, how did the slave trackers get more slaves from 1808 until 1865. You know how? The slave empire transformed from importation to production. They went to breeding farms. Right here in Maryland, where my family was incarcerated. Breeding farms! What was a breeding farm? It was a house, more like a barn. 12 black women or more, one black man. She was called an itch, and he was called a buck. And his job was to keep the women pregnant so they could supply more babies for the slave industry. Guess what, black woman? If you ain't raising your child right, black man, if you ain't raising your children right, then your house is a breeding farm for future incarceration victims. If your son can't read, by the time he finishes the fifth grade, there's a 75% chance he'll spend some of his adulthood in jail. Oh, yes. And guess what? Most of our kids don't need special ed. All they need is a tutor and some extra practice. I'm trying to understand why you parents in Maryland think special ed is going to solve a problem. I've been in special ed for 30 years. I'm the school psychologist. I do the testing. I do the diagnosing. Can somebody in here tell me what's so special about special ed? Because I ain't figured it out yet. Oh, I know. They lie to y'all when y'all come into the meeting. Oh, Miss Shaquita, we have good news. <laughs> Ray Kwan qualified for IEP services. Let me tell you what's so good about this. He's going to go into a small class. It's only going to be about eight to ten of kids. He'll never get left down again, ever again. And guess what? We don't grade our special ed kids based on achievement. 
we grade the special ed kids based on effort. So Raheem, Raekwon, is likely to make the honor roll every marking period because he will never, ever again be graded based on achievement. He's going to be graded based on effort. So you know what that means? The next report card period, Raekwon came home with straight A's and B's. You said, oh, my God, Dr. Umar, I don't know what he's talking about. My son never had nothing higher than a D. He got all A's and B's. Special ed works. No, it don't. Those are not achievement grades. Those are effort grades. You want to know why so many black kids in Baltimore end up in the 12th grade and never get a diploma? You don't find out to the 10th grade they can't read because they've been getting straight A's and B's off the IEP. And it wasn't until they got to that graduation test, that Maryland State assessment, and then they failed it, that you realize they could never read. And you say, well, if he can't read, how are you getting A's and B's? Because in special ed, you're legally allowed to deceive the parents. I live it every day. You can't tell me nothing about no special lead. If my son had a reading problem, I'm getting a tutor. My daughter got a math problem, I'm getting a tutor. And most of the time, their problem has nothing to do with learning. It's all effort and motivation. He could learn how to read. He don't care to learn. She could learn how to do algebra. She don't care to learn. Because after all, Raekwon is going to be a football player, a basketball player, a rapper, and Rashida, she's going to be the next Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, Glorilla, or whatever that's. <laughs> and I want to blame the black fathers in here. Black father, listen, I'm talking to my men right now. I understand you wanted to make it to the NFL. I understand you wanted to go to the NBA. I understand you wanted to be an NBL National Baseball League superstar, but you were not good enough. I'm here to tell you right now in the presence of God and my ancestors, no black man has any right to force his son to try to make up for his personal failures. I am sick and tired of black fathers forcing their sons to be athletes because you got a low self-esteem complex and you need your boy to solve it for you. If that boy don't want to be a basketball player, so be it. If he don't want to be a football player, so be it. Are you aware your son is more likely to be struck by lightning than to become a multi-million dollar professional athlete? He's more likely to get hit by lightning than to become a millionaire athlete and every black boy in Baltimore think he's going to be the next one. And Lord knows we don't need another Ray Lewis because if there's anything called a coon in the state of Maryland, When Freddie Gray got his spine separated from his neck and they asked Ray Lewis about the tragedy and they caught Ray Lewis down on his knee when Colin Kaepernick took the knee, did you hear what Ray Lewis said? He said, I wasn't taking a knee. I was praying to the Lord. You coward. You mean to tell me just because you got a big old statue in front of the stadium, you will sell out the whole city of Baltimore because white folks put you on a statue. And that's why we gotta build up our community infrastructure. Because as long as white folks can finance our men and finance our women and finance our kids to work against us, we will never be free. And by the way, the word coon is an acronym. C-O-O-N, coon is an acronym and it stands for consciousness of the oppressor operating inside the Negro. Why did Dr. Umar say we should not get our kids evaluated under the fourth grade? You know why? The younger your child is, the more likely it's a misdiagnosis. Seven years old, you cannot prove a reading disability. Six years old, you cannot prove a math disability. Five years old, you cannot prove autism. Four years old, you cannot prove ADHD. Eight years old, you cannot prove an intellectual disability. The younger your kids are, the more likely the diagnosis is wrong. And then some of y'all say, well, wait a minute, doc. If it ain't good to test the young kids, why does school keep begging me to test them? You know why? Because special ed equals more money. 
Special ed is big bucks. Special ed is a hustle and a racket. Every time I put a kid in special ed, the school gets a welfare check. Special ed kids are worth twice as much as regular children. So let's say hypothetically, in Baltimore County, they spend $12,000 per kid, 12 grand per kid. The minute Dr. Umar or another school psychologist says he's retarded, autistic, intellectually disabled, emotionally disturbed, reading disabled, math disabled, listening disabled, comprehension disabled, he not worth 12,000 or more, he worth 24,000. And guess what? They get the extra 12 every year. So let's do some simple math. Your son is in the second grade. You let him get tested in the second grade, even though Dr. Umar told you not to. And the reason you wanted him tested is you wanted to get an SSI check. Black parents hustling their kids for money. Now, let me clarify. I don't have a problem with you getting an SSI check if your son really do got a problem. I got a big problem if you get an SSI check for a kid who you know ain't got a damn thing wrong with. Are y'all following me? So, Raekwon, second grade, Special ed, misdiagnosed, 12,000 extra dollars. He got 10 more years of school. What's 12,000 times 10 years of school? $120,000 Baltimore City Schools got for Raekwon. How much do they get for 20 Raekwons? How much do they get for 50 Raekwons? How much do they get for 100 Raekwons? This Baltimore, how much do they get for a thousand Raekwons? I wonder what the special ed budget is in Baltimore schools. I bet you it's in the millions. That means you got white people living in the suburbs of Baltimore. Nice house, nice car, vacation days, retirement, summers off, good pension. And they're making a living off your son's misdiagnosis. And you know what's interesting? So many white teachers are married to white police. So many white teachers are married to white police. What are you saying, Ifa Tunde? I'm saying they use the white woman to miseducate our sons. And when the white woman is done miseducating our sons, she calls her husband to come take them to jail. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, as I prepare to wrap up, I want to be clear about something. We can fix the schools, but one thing we will never be able to do is make a white woman care about your son more than you do. The point that I'm making, at the end of the day, black America is going to have to do what Dr. Umar is doing up in Wilmington, Delaware, and that is build our own schools for our own children. Nothing is wrong with the black boy's ability to learn. Ain't nothing wrong with your son. They got you thinking, the black boy's so special. He's so violent. He's so retarded. He's so athletic. He's so different. He's so this. He's so that. The problem is not the black boy. The problem is how the black boy is treated. And the reason they want to exaggerate the black boy's problems is so they can get more money for them problems. More problems, more money. Biggie Small said it first. Baltimore schools don't want to fix those problems because there's so much grant money for the problems. You got violent kids, grant money. Special ed kids, grant money. Kids can't read, grant money. Single mother home, grant money. Incarcerated dad, grant money. And none of the problems get solved with any of that money. Do you know most public school money goes to do what? Hire more white people. Where Baltimore City schools get a big grant, you say, oh my God, the schools are getting $20 million. Hold your breath. None of that money will get to the inside of your son's class. Most money in the black school district is used to do what? Hire more white people. Your son can learn. The problem with the black boy is he's not a white girl. Public schools are ran by women, white women and a few coons. And when a black boy come to school and he can't sit still, he's automatic, automatically considered behaviorally disordered. Because a white girl can sit still all day. A black girl can almost sit still all day. 
But when a prepubescent black boy starts developing into a man, every man in here knows what I'm talking about. When we got 9, 10, 11 years old, we wanted to tackle, jump. We were so full of energy, we didn't try to tackle the damn tree. Brothers know what I'm talking about. We couldn't sit still because testosterone. He got testosterone. Ain't no fifth grade boy want to sit there listening to Helen Keller and Anne Frank in Columbus all damn day. He got testosterone. Now what happens to our girls when y'all go through puberty, ladies? You sleep all day. You getting your menses and your ovaries is developing, your breast, your body is getting ready to bear child. So you sleep. Estrogen. Boys don't sleep when they develop. They get hype. But if the school is ran by lazy white women, why are you surprised there's so many ADHD diagnoses? But I want to be clear. I don't blame the white woman exclusively. This is not all about the snow bunny. You know why? Nobody can special educate your child unless you sign your name four times. I'm going to say it again. Nobody can special educate your child unless you sign your name four times. You signed permission for the psychologist to evaluate. You signed agreement with my evaluation. You signed the IEP, incarceration preparation education. And then you sign the special ed service agreement. Your name is on four pieces of paper. If you didn't sign any one of those four pieces of paper, he don't go to special ed. So stop calling me up talking about Dr. Umar, they put my child in special ed. Uh-uh, we put my child in special ed. Brothers and sisters, Joe Biden has another year after this one. And then there will be a new presidential election. And if we want different results in the next presidential election, we have to organize ourselves as an independent black political union and force our agenda onto the tables of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. As long as you keep on voting Democrat without any promises, you'll never get anything. I am not interested in you switching your loyalty to the Republican Party either. Neither party cares about black people. We need an independent party or an independent unit, and we must vote as one unit for our own best interests. As long as the Democrats know you're going to vote without demanding nothing, they'll never respect you. As long as the Republicans know you're going to ignore them without a conversation, they're never going to respect you. I'm trying to figure out what made black people so loyal to the Democratic Party. We've been voting Democrats since FDR in the 1930s. Do you know in 12 years we would have voted Democrat for an entire century? Can somebody tell me what did the Democratic Party do for black folks so great that they earned our votes for 100 consecutive years? I don't fault you. It's the black bourgeoisie who does this to you. It's black Negroes, well-placed Negroes in Baltimore who brainwashed the working class and brainwashed the poor class and brainwash the underclass into thinking the Democratic Party is the party of black America. It's time for you to wake up. Bill Clinton locked up more black men than all Republican presidents put together. Joe Biden took more civil rights away from black folks than all Republican presidents put together. Barack Obama ignored black people for eight years and gave everything we fought for over to the homosexuals, the immigrants, and the women. Prove me wrong. I do not vote unless the candidate is independent. If you are not an independent black candidate, I cannot vote for a Democratic flunky. I cannot vote for a Republican flunky. You must be independent. Why? Because if you're not an independent candidate, you don't have an independent mind, you don't have an independent bank account, you don't have an independent plan or program. So if you can't think for yourself, if you need Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden to think for you, I don't vote for you. Baltimore, we got five major problems in black America. Every city got the same problems. Right here in Baltimore, you got miseducation. Which one of your elected officials is doing something about it? Right here in Baltimore, you got gentrification. 
black people being pushed out onto the street, the unemployment rate going through the roof. What black elected official you got doing something about it? In Baltimore, police brutality and genocide, and Baltimore has one of the lowest percentages of black police officers. You know, in Baltimore, they hire white ex-military cutouts to come into Baltimore and police black people they never even met before. Why aren't your elected officials doing anything about that? What about mass incarceration? Maryland, the state of my ancestors, Maryland incarcerates black men per capita more than any state in America. You have the worst black male incarceration rate per capita out of all 50 states. Which one of your elected officials is doing anything about it? I understand you have a black mayor. Excuse me, a black governor for the first time, right? Mayor and governor and attorney general. When's the last time we met with them? When's the last time we made some demands? Better yet, who financed their campaigns? Get a list of the campaign contributors for your governor, and you'll know whose agenda he's pushing. I'm not going to criticize him because I haven't seen the list. Maybe he might want to do right. But there's one thing for certain and two things I'm sure of. The hand that pays is the hand that rules. We got to get organized, and we have to stop letting black bourgeoisies brainwash us against our own best interests. I want to close with this. I need y'all to understand this. Some of you are going to have trouble comprehending this, but you'll get it maybe 30 years later. Three rules of racism. Don't you ever forget them. You got them directly from Dr. Umar. Rule number one, all white people are racist. It's quiet because you're multicultural. Listen, I didn't say all white people hate black people because they don't. I didn't say all white people wish you dead because they don't. I didn't say all white people are bigots because they're not. I said all white people are racist. What is racism? It is a group system organized by an entire people to disadvantage all members of another group. Racism is not about hatred. Racism is not necessarily about the KKK. Racism is not about the N-word. Racism is about two things, and you better understand this. Privilege and power. White people don't have to hate you. They just don't want you to have an opportunity. Do you understand me? A white racist is a white person who wants white Maryland to have an unfair, disproportionate level of control over resources opportunities and power. That's it. So for all you snow bunny loving black men in here, that white girl you making babies with, I'm willing to bet you 10 to 1, she still wants white people to have all the control, all the resources, and all the privileges. Racism is not about hating nobody. Racism is about controlling everybody. And this is why you black people with white friends don't understand racism, because you got white people who treat you damn good. But when you're not looking, all other black people are still the N-word. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I knew a sister. She had a white best friend. They grew up together, got married together, had their birthdays together. The white best friend heard about a promotion on the job. The sister was qualified for it. The white girl wasn't. The white girl didn't tell her best friend about the promotion. She told a white woman she didn't even know. The black woman came, Dr. Umar, how can my best friend do this to me? I said, wipe your eyes. I need you to understand something. What she did is what she was supposed to do. She is white. Your relationship with her is personal. It's personal. But her obligation to keep white people in charge, that's professional. She is your friend, if you believe you can have a white friend. But she got an obligation to all white people to make sure they maintain power, privilege, and opportunity. So I need all you Negroes to understand that. 
White people might loan you some money. They might help you fight against the police. They might fight for your kids. The white lawyers might fight against environmental racism. They might have a poverty program for the homeless, a poverty program for the single moms, a poverty program for the ex-offenders, a poverty program for those who are illiterate. But will they ever, will they ever give you an opportunity to excel at the same level as their own? That's the only question you need to answer. And black women, I know you see a lot of black men dating outside the race. Don't you catch snow puppy fever. I don't want you puppy shopping. Do you understand me? Because I'm going to be honest with you. I say it in the presence of the most high God. And I mean it. There's nothing more despicable under the sun than for a black woman queen mother of humanity to spread her wings and let a devil inject his ancestors into your heaven. I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to go half on a baby with Christopher Columbus. I don't know about you. I'm not trying to go half on a baby with Adolf Hitler. I don't know about you. I'm not trying to go half on a baby with George Washington. I don't know about you. I'm not trying to go half on a baby with Thomas Jefferson. Because you do know when you make a baby, that's two ancestral families coming together. Could you imagine Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, John Jacques Dessalines, Ida B. Wells, Anna Julia Cooper, Sojourner Truth, Fannie Lou Hamer having a cookout with Margaret Sanger? George Bush Sr. What kind of cookout is that? What kind of cookout is that? Stop mixing your melanin with your enemies. Take out your phone. I want to give you my cell number. Take out your phone. I want to give you my cell number. Before I give you my cell number, I want to say thank you to all the brothers and sisters across the state of Maryland who stood by me for nine years through the criticism and the hate while we built the first school in American history to be created by the African diaspora, the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy. And I got good news for you, Baltimore. There will be a bus that comes to Wilmington, Delaware every single morning from the city of Baltimore for your second, third, and fourth grade boys to come to the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you how the school gonna work. We will begin school on September the 3rd of 2024. That is the anniversary of my cousin Frederick Douglass's escape from slavery right here in the city of Baltimore. And Frederick Douglass came through Wilmington on his way to Philly. Harriet Tubman came through Wilmington on her way to Philadelphia. Henry Highland Garnett, Pan-Africanist preacher, he might have been AME as well, but not one of the bishops, came through Wilmington. So guess what? Your boys are going to come through Wilmington for their freedom as well. The first year, second, third, and fourth grade. The second year, first through fifth grade. The third year, K through sixth grade. The fourth year, pre-K through seventh grade. The fifth year, daycare through eighth. And then the following year, ninth through twelfth. I'm hoping by year three, we will have the Princess Academy ready to go. Now, listen to me. For us to make this work, Baltimore, you got to help me out, and this is how. I need a black bus company that can take our children from Baltimore, 75 miles to Wilmington. It's about an hour and 15 minutes. Some of you might feel that's too long of a bus ride for your children, and I respect you. But some of you also remember once upon a time, some of us had to walk to school for more than two hours. What good, what, what, what's wrong with a one hour bus ride? But if you want that freedom education for your son, He'll get used to that ride real quick. I need black bus drivers in Baltimore 
It could be a school bus. It could be a coach bus. It could also be minivan. If you got a 15 passenger, if you got an 18 passenger, let's have a conversation. I'm going to give you my phone number. Let's see if we can work out an agreement financially that will properly compensate you to bring them to school in the morning and bring them back at the end of the day. And in a few years, I'm hoping we have a dormitory so they can stay up there during the week and come home on the weekend. You're only 75 minutes away. Some of you will probably end up moving to Delaware because not only will we be a school by day, we will be a black community organizing center by night. We will have classes for our pregnant women. We will have classes for black men and black women who are thinking about getting married so we can help them get them over that room, have pastors come and marry them up. We're going to have a black women's conference, black men's conference, black business conference. In the next couple of days, I'm going to a black farm on the eastern shore. In the next couple of days, a black farmer just reached out to me last week and said, come on down here and see what we're doing. We would love to have your boys come from Wilmington to the eastern shore of Maryland where your ancestors are buried and teach them how to grow their own food, brothers and sisters. We're talking revolution. We're talking revolution. The Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy will have six curriculums in addition to math, science, reading, and social studies. We will have agronomical and agricultural curriculum. We will have a dietary and nutritional curriculum. We will have a military and political science curriculum. Your second grade son will learn martial arts. Your second grade son will learn proper use of a military weapon. Your second grade son will learn how to defend his mother in the event there's no man in the house. We starting them as babies, brothers and sisters. Every child will learn two African languages. Every child will learn two African languages. There will also be financial and economic science. They're going to learn how to trade stocks in elementary school. They're going to learn the basics of real estate in elementary school. They're going to learn the basics of investment in elementary school. And when they graduate from 12th grade, they'll get their first business loan from their school. We will also teach spiritual and astrological science. Yes, we will teach them the science of communicating with your ancestors. We do not worship our ancestors. We worship the one God. But our ancestors are our angels in African culture. They are our angels. Your deceased grandmother is with you now, but when have you last talked to her? Your father who died is with you now, but when have you last went to the water, poured some water, and called your father to have a conversation with you? Everybody who has ever died still lives. Eternal life is real. But the problem with black people is we have let white people cut us off from our living family relatives. They are still with you right now, brothers and sisters. We're going to have an ancestral altar on the campus. Every boy will have a relic from one of his ancestors inside of a sacred room. And every week, we will pour water to those ancestors and ask them to protect us and help us educate your children in the name of the one almighty God. Brothers and sisters, if you want to work at the school, send me your resume. Don't worry about being certified. Private school certification is different from public. Don't worry about having no teaching degree. I just want to ask you one question. If you can answer this question, yes, I need a resume from you. Do you have a skill? Is this something special you know how to do that you believe black boys would be better off when they become men if they learned how to do it? You might know how to sew clothes. Come teach it. You might know how to hunt. Come teach it. You may know how to build computers. Come teach it. You may know how to cut hair. Come teach it. I have a brother who's going to teach our students how to make their own shoes. You know, it was a black man by the name of Jan Mexlinger from Pennsylvania who invented the machine to tie the sole to the shoe. Y'all don't even know that. I got another black man. He's a crabfish seaman. He's going to teach our boys how to go shellfish crabbing for lobsters and shrimps, and we're going to have a seafood fry every week at FDMG so we can have some shrimps and some cocktail sauce. Oh, yes! It's going to be a party, brothers and sisters. And if you don't have a second through fourth grader, your son can still be a part of our FDMG program on the weekends and holidays because we will have a rites of passage manhood training program. So he can be a student in the school, or he can simply be a member of the school. We're going to have something for everybody, brothers and sisters. And I want to thank y'all because we regularly get donations from Maryland.
Donations come in from all over the state of Maryland, and that's why we're going to have a bus coming from Baltimore. Raise your hand if you got a second, third, or fourth grader next year. Anybody got a second, third, or fourth grader? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's about 10 of you in here. Let's say we only get 10 from Baltimore. Then we'll just need a minivan. So if any of y'all know somebody with a minivan service, have them call me up. Because if we only get about 10 or 20, we probably can do two vans instead of a 40-passenger bus. But there will be a bus from Baltimore. There will be a bus from Maryland Eastern Shore. There will be a bus from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A bus from Chester, Pennsylvania. A bus from Trenton, New Jersey. A bus from Camden, New Jersey. A bus from Dover, Delaware. And a bus from Wilmington. Four states, two buses. We will be the only black school in the country that's educating black boys in four states. I want to close with a quote, but let me give you my number so you can reach me. 215-989-9858. 215-989-9858. Once more, 215-989-9858. That's my personal cell phone number. Don't call me because I don't answer the phone. Text me. Unless you pastor, I don't pick up. You got me? Text me. You got a question? Text me. You need to schedule a consult? Text me. Here's the last thing I'm going to tell you. The school will be done in about a week or two. We just got a little bit of HVAC. Thank you. And congratulations to y'all, because it's not my school. It's our school. We're going to have a grand opening for the community to come celebrate. That grand opening might be the last Saturday of this month. It might be the last Saturday of this month. It's going to depend on whether we get the occupancy certificate from the city in time. If we don't get it, the grand opening will be in April. How will you know when the grand opening will be? Hopefully, the new website will be up by then. But if it's not, if you're on social media, make sure you follow me on Twitter, at Dr. Umar Johnson. If you're on uh, Instagram, Follow me at Dr. Umar Johnson. If you're on Facebook, follow me at Dr. Umar Ifatunde. And you could go to my website, drumarjohnson.com. Click on my social media from there. You can also email me from there, and I will have the flyer for the grand opening posted on there if the school's own website is not up, because I want all y'all to come and celebrate. But I do have a disclaimer. This has been a nine-year process. If you've never donated to the school, you will not be welcomed at the celebration. So I'm telling you now, go to my website and click on the donations to the school. I don't care if you get $50, $25, Cash App, PayPal, check a money order, but make sure you send in a donation so that you are welcomed at the celebration. Okay? That rule does not apply to elders. Who are elders? those above the age of 64. If you are 65 or older, we would like a donation, but we don't require it. And of course, under 18, our children obviously are not required to donate. But if you are between the ages of 18 and 64, I need to see your name on that Cash App, PayPal, or check a money or the donation list. If you want to work at the school, send me your resume, the email address for resumes, or if you want to volunteer, fdmgresumes at gmail.com, f-d-m-g-r-e-s-u-m-e-s. -E -E we need security guards. We need bus drivers. We need social workers. We need teachers. We need people who can do natural hair. We need raw and vegan dietitians for our food program. We will be 90% raw and vegan, 90%. If you are a vegan chef, if you know how to cook wholesome vegan meals, you can get your paperwork and your license through the city of Wilmington, and you can be the person who provides breakfast or lunch to our boys. I want to make sure there's a money opportunity for you guys. Right now, I'm looking for somebody who knows how to do drop ceiling, and I'm looking for somebody who knows how to put a fence up. We need a fence in back of the school, and we need somebody to come repair some of the drop ceiling in the classrooms. If you know somebody who can do fences or do drop ceiling, give them my number. I'm ready to pay them right now so we can finish this up. The time is now. It's no coincidence we bought that school the centennial year of Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line, which was incorporated in Delaware. It's no coincidence we bought that school, the bicentennial of Frederick Douglass's birthday. 
that year. It's no coincidence we bought that school in 2019, which was the 400 years quadricentennial of black people's arrival in America. It's no coincidence. This school was ordered by the Most High, but we have to still make it work. I want to see all y'all at the grand opening celebration. Frederick Douglass said, <laughs> Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess the favor of freedom but deprecate agitation are like men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want the rain, but they're scared of the thunder or the lightning. They want ocean water, but they're scared of the awful roar of the waves. Frederick said, a man may not get all he pays for, but you will pay for all that you get. And if we as a people are ever to become free of the injustices inflicted upon us, we must pay for their removal. We may pay with blood. We may pay with words. We may pay with blows. We may pay with our life. But he who wants to be free must himself strike the first blow. Frederick Douglass said, for 20 years, I prayed on my knees to God for freedom. But the good Lord gave Frederick Douglass no freedom until I got up off my knees and start praying with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white people, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you will never respect you. And the man who respects you has no need for pity. My family came to Maryland in 1701. A black man named Bailey, stolen from Nigeria. He married a black woman named Selah, for whom my 11-year-old daughter is named. In 1745, they had my grandmom, Jenny. In 1774, grandmom, Jenny, gave birth to my grandmom, Betsy, the matriarch of the family. She was born into slavery, but she married a free black man, my grandpa, Isaac. They had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet. Another daughter was named young Betsy, my five times great-grandmother. These two sisters were raped by Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned our family. As a result of that rape, on February the 14th, Aunt Harriet gave birth to the greatest black leader in American history. His name, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. At the age of 20, Cousin Fred ran away from Baltimore, through Wilmington, up into Philadelphia, and on to New York. When he got married to his queen, his black wife of 50 years, Anna Murray Douglas, he decided to change his name to hide his identity. So Frederick Bailey became Frederick Douglas. He married Auntie Anna. They had five children. One son was named Charles. Another son was named Louis. They fought in the U.S. Civil War as a member of the 54th Massachusetts Colored Regiment. If you've ever seen the movie Glory, Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, that's the story of my cousins, Louis and Charles Douglas. My grandfather, Stephen, was born one year after Frederick. Stephen Henry Bailey fought in the U.S. Colored Troops of Maryland, 9th Regiment, and his son, my three times great-grandfather and first black public school teacher in Denton, George Washington Bailey, fought in the 19th U.S. Colored Troops. Do you know what that means? That means my grandfather, George, was at Appomattox Courthouse when General Robert E. Lee conceded defeat of the Confederacy. My grandfather was there. My grandfather, Stephen, was in Galveston, Texas, when General Gordon Granger gave Special Field Order Number 3 on June 19, 1865, emancipating all Africans in Texas previously held in bondage, now known as the Juneteenth holiday. My grandfather was there. Why do I say that? Stop letting people make you think Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. Abraham Lincoln didn't free the slaves. The slaves freed Abraham Lincoln, brothers and sisters. We freed him. He didn't free us. So Grandpa George marries Grandmom Annie. She's the niece of Bishop Alexander Wayman, seventh bishop of the AME Church. They have Grandmom Caroline. She moves to Philadelphia. She has Grandma Vivian. Grandma Vivian marries a Spanish-speaking Cuban African from Havana. My grandfather Cicero, who I met on his deathbed before he went to the ancestors. They have my Grandmom Ida, who passed away five years ago. She met and married James Johnson. They had my father, Jamal. He met and married Barbara. And on August the 21st, in the ghettos of North Philadelphia, the anniversary of the Nat Turner War, the anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, the anniversary of George Jackson Prison War, the first day Emmett Till showed up in Mississippi, August the 21st, 
in the original birth date of Jesus the Christ, August the 21st. I was born in Philadelphia. The most honorable Marcus Garvey said, the most honorable Marcus Garvey said, who gave us this flag, he said, without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. With confidence, you have won even before you have started. Marcus Garvey said, God never intended us to be a people without a nation of our own, and we are not going to abuse God's confidence in us as men. Garvey was once asked, are you an African or are you a Jamaican? Are you an African or are you a Jamaican? And Marcus Garvey looked up and the leader of the largest black organization in modern history, no Garvey, no Elijah, no Garvey, no Malcolm, no Garvey, no Panthers, no Garvey, no Stokely, no Garvey, no Huey. Garvey was first and they all copied Garvey. Garvey looked up and he said, you ask me, am I African or am I Jamaican? And I say to you, I would never, ever, ever give up a continent for an island. I am an African. Yesterday, today, for all time. Baltimore, Maryland. One love, black family. One love. Pastor, do we got time for maybe five quick questions? I'm going to take five quick questions. When I'm done, if anyone would like to take a photo, we can do that. I have copies of my book outside in the hallway. I also have hoodies for the sisters outside in the hallway as well. You can purchase that. We also have some vendors out in the hallway. We got the good brother Irritated Genie out there. Make sure you support him. We got a few other vendors in the hallway. Make sure you support them. Everybody takes Cash App and every other way. Let me take a few questions. You're number one. Don't forget your number. Brother in the black, you're number two. Queen, you're number three. In the black, my brother, you're number four. And right here in the white, you're number five. That's going to be it for the night. So we have time to take some photos and sign some books. Number one, where you at? I'm going to repeat the question. Go right ahead, sister. question. One of the biggest challenges you're going to have, as I mentioned earlier, is the multiculturalization of black consciousness. You're going to have to fight other black students at the HBCU to understand why a white Latina cannot be Miss HBCU. We have been brainwashed out of putting ourselves first. Black people are not a priority for anybody. And we're not even a priority for ourselves. So you're going to have to inject a new consciousness of African family first into your student body. Marcus Garvey called it race first. We have to get comfortable making black people our priority. As long as we keep on looking out for every other group, as much as we look out for ourselves, we will stay exactly where we are. So I hope you took my number. I would love to come to Morgan State. I was invited to Morgan State. I spoke at Morgan State, I want to say, six years ago for Black History Month. So I do have a precedent of being there. I wasn't disinvited. So I'll be looking for my second invitation. Great question. Who's my number two? King. Two of five. How's it going? My name is Perrin Johnson. Yes, sir. Um, so I had a question about your speech earlier, talking about unity within our community, that 
that's what we're lacking. Yes, we, sir. That, that's what kept us together. Typically, when you have unity with a governing, like a body of people, there's some kind of governance that holds them together. With Christianity, it's the Bible. With the Quran, it's for Islam. The Torah is for the Jewish community. And with America, quote, unquote, is the Constitution. Uh -huh. Within the ideals of Pan-Africanism, what body of governance do we have that we follow, like rules and laws? For example, when there's like violence against a black woman, there's no like doctor that says that's wrong. It's understood, but how do we hold people accountable? For example, with Stephen A. Smith, Shannon Sharp, and Ray Lewis Cooning is a good, you gave them lashings. So when there's a punishment for going against the code, if you would, it keeps people in check. I don't see that for our community. Like we have these things that we follow by to maintain a sense of order. Great question. Before we can hold black people accountable, we have to have a sense of community. The quickest way to cause chaos is to implement rules and laws where there's no consensus for those rules and laws. We would just turn on each other. So we have to achieve the village consciousness and the community concept. We have to sit down and we have to build that. One of the things we're going to do at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy this will be open to any African in the world. We're going to create the Team Pan-African Village. This will be a community that you pay a membership into, and we will take care of our own. We will grow our own food. We will invest in our children. We will shop together in bulk to keep the prices down. We guarantee to buy from other black people in that village before we go outside. But it will be non-denominational and based on African consciousness. So for those of you who have ever wanted to be part of a real black community, you will get that chance as soon as the school is up and running. And it doesn't matter if your children go to the school or not. We have to create the village concept again. See, the school is just the beginning for me. I want Black Wall Street. I want a hospital. I want a bank. I want a supermarket. I want manufacturing. I want distribution. The school is the safest thing to start with. But make no mistake. Dr. Umar's vision is much bigger than the schools. We have to create an independent reality for our people. Because in case you ain't been paying attention, America is done caring about black people. Not that she ever was. But when they will bring Ukrainians here and give Ukrainians free medical, free housing, and then tell them they can qualify for a social security disability check, they don't pay taxes, never worked, didn't build the country. So they're making it clear to you that we even care about non-citizens more than we care about black folks. So we have to make a future for ourselves. And black parents of high school students, please consider sending your child to trade school instead of college. College ain't doing nothing but putting black people into debt. Now, if they want to be dentists and engineers and teachers and psychologists and educators, send them to college. But if your child is not married to a particular career, send them to trade school. Two years, licensed plumber. Two years, licensed electrician. Two years, licensed HVAC, licensed welding, licensed roofer. I look at the money we paying to get that school up and running. And I say, my God, although I love psychology and don't regret my profession, sometimes I wish I would have went to trade school instead. These electrical contracts, a hundred grand for two weeks of work. A hundred grand plumbing, 50 grand for a week of work. They're making in a week what some of us take a whole year to make. I'm telling you, if it was up to me, every black child would go to trade school. They could go to college after they're done. Please consider sending your children to trade school. And on that note, we will be having the black college tour this coming spring. We're going to have two tours. We're going to have a tour for 11 to 17 and 18 to 25. If you have children who are above the age of 17, who lost their step in life, went through a little something, something, might have became a wee head, might have became a baby mom, might have went to jail, but they still trying to get their life in order. My 18 to 25 year old college tour is designed for young adults who we still believe in. You understand me? So that would be the 18 to 25 year old tour and 11 to 17 will be for our 11 to 17 year old children. I will need chaperones for the tour. <laughs> As we get closer, to the tour, I will let you guys know in case you want to be a chaperone. Ladies, you got to be natural to be a chaperone. Brothers, you can't be snow bunny hopping to be a chaperone. Okay? 
Who's my number three? Queen. Thank you. I'm listening, Queen. Get me as, I say this everywhere I go. Nobody has done it yet. Get me a school building. I'll take care of the rest. Y'all got empty schools all over Baltimore. Get me one. I went to Detroit and told Detroit, they got the most school buildings in Chicago. Nobody delivered me a school. Every city I go to, Dallas, Phoenix, L.A., Oakland, Minneapolis, Milwaukee, all these schools close. Nobody has brought me a school. We don't need no money from the government. We don't need no handouts or nothing. Just get me the building. Get me the building, and we can have FDMG Baltimore. It's that simple. Now, let me tell you why it's so hard to get the building. The reason they closed the schools down is so white people could come buy them up and turn them into private gated communities and raise up the property. So they don't want to sell no school to Dr. Umar because we're trying to get the black people out of Baltimore. If we let him open up a school, he's going to bring them into Baltimore. But that don't mean we can't get one. I wouldn't be surprised if it's somebody black somewhere who owned a school, who got a deed and just sitting there and not even using it. All we need is the building. Realtor. Got it. Okay. I got two points. Baltimore do got some good orange juice, though. <laughs> Cut it out, best. Two points, Queen. Point number one. When you say charter, are you speaking of charter school? Chapter. Chapter. Okay. There's an organization that I started in Baltimore about six years ago. I started it right here. It's called the National Independent Black Parent Association. If anybody in here who wants to join that organization to help us organize our parents in Baltimore City and every other city in Maryland and the DMV, I'm going to have a reorganizing conference at the school in Wilmington to train you how to be a parent advocate, right? And once you've been trained on how to be a parent advocate, that's a 12-hour boot camp. We start at 8 in the morning, and we go till 8 at night. And I'm going to holler at Pastor because I saw the side room you had, which would be ideal for the boot camp. So I'm going to get with Pastor, y'all, and we're going to choose a date. And I'm coming back, okay, to Empowerment Temple, and we'll be in the other room. And we're going to do the Black Parent Boot Camp training for all y'all who want to learn how to be advocates and chapter presidents for the National Independent Black Parent Association. Okay? We're going to make that happen. Thank you for that. Number four. Four out of five. Four out of five. Can I... Yes, there you go. Good go evening, ahead, brother. How you doing, man? Yes, sir. My name is Saquon Merritt, owner of Lightning Electric, commercial contracting company here in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Five years removed from prison. Um, I want to know exactly. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We salute you, brother. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. We salute you. And I know what you mentioned in regards to trade school and everything. That's definitely imperative. And it's four to five years Got just you. in the state of Maryland in order to get your license. Imperative. Ah. But I want to know exactly what is your school doing in regards to teaching brothers how to own their own contracted company? We don't want guys to just work. Absolutely. I experience a lot. Everything mm -hmm. with the permission of the law, what I've learned has been through YouTube and just hard reading and grinding. Mm -hmm. When it comes to blueprints, when it comes to looking at these contracts, invoices, things of this nature, it is a beast. And that's 75% mm -hmm. of my business, not Powerful. my brothers out in the field. Powerful. We need to do more in that regards. And that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to know. Did you mm -hmm. have plans? Did you have an amazing mind, brother? What you yes, doing? Sir. I commend you on. Reached out to you on Instagram and YouTube. Wait for you to get back. Well, you got my cell now. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I text you. I get I a thousand you. Instagram. And I called you. You got to text me because if I don't know you, All right. I ain't going to pick up that phone. It could be an agent. <laughs> you feel? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So like today, when we take our pictures, right, text me your picture with your name. Now you locked in my phone with your picture. So when you call me, 
I said, okay, that's the brother I met at Collection. Yeah. I get Negroes and ninjas who call me FaceTime Live. <laughs> no name or nothing thinking I'm going to answer that damn phone. I'm not answering that phone. Right. But now that we met, I got a face to it. Right. Now when you hit me, we can build. Right, Once we get to the high school, mm -hmm. that's when we're going to implement the trades. Okay. We're about five years from that. But me and you need to link because I need you yeah. to be a part of that. Absolutely. You understand me? Okay. I need you to be a part of that. Okay. And I also need you to come look at the high school because that's our next renovation. I need to get up there. I'm oh, trying to get up there. You, you said you hired a white company as an electrician. I'm upset about that. That's Don't why be I'm upset because we I'm got ripped off by that. 10 blacks. Okay. Don't be upset. But listen, <laughs> I need you for the high school, brother. I'm a in master the high license school. electrician. And with the permission of a law, I know every nigga cranny about this stuff. I don't play with it. All you got to do is text me, Doc. I was there. I'm the brother, the electrician. Wow. All you got to do is give me a date and a time. The address of the school, I'm giving all y'all the address right now because when we had a grand opening, you know where you coming. 610 East 17th Street. 610 East 17th Street, Wilmington, Delaware, 19802. That's where you're going to come for the grand opening. You're going to text me. I, wanna, I, I would like you to get there in the next week if possible. Inshallah. Do the okay. walkthrough. Okay. Tell me what you think. Give me a price we can live with. Let's get that high school popping. Because once the high school ready, we are now the largest independent black school in the country. And we can host any conference, workshop, seminar, retreat. I'm going to go after the black sororities. I'm telling you now. Once our school, once the campus is fully done, I don't want to hear about no black sorority having no conference at no white hotel. Come do it at our school. Pay us that money. We need it to live. Instead of having fun at all these white hotels, paying them millions of dollars, the NAACP, the Urban League, all the professional black conferences making rich white people richer. All these HBCUs, why they not having that conference at Bowie State? Why you not having that conference at Coppin State? Why you not having that conference at University of Maryland Eastern Shore? You want to go to a white hotel where you know you're being mistreated because we still seeking validation. I want to see you at the campus soon, my brother. Number five. Final question. I feel kind of funny um, addressing it because everybody else talks about realistic kinds of things. Yes. But I think we really um, need to think about why do black women invest so much money in beauty? That's what we need to address. We need to address black men that don't find black women attractive. If I agree. I agree. If my hair is not permed or I agree. if I don't have the different color hair. I think that's the argument. Not so much that black women are doing all that they're doing. It's both. It's both sides, yeah, but, but you're that, correct. But that black man needs to be addressed because black men are more attracted to any woman but a black A lot man. of us are. Not all, but you're correct. You're correct. I'll tell you like this. In agreement with you, if every black man in this room went home today, as a Black History Month New Year's resolution and told they woman, I do not date women with fake or processed hair. Every sister will be natural in a month. I'm serious. Black men have the power to make our women go natural. I agree with you, sister. The main reason our women are imitating Caucasians is because they notice that we are only attracted or largely attracted to black women who have a European phenotype. And so the black woman is trying to emulate that person that she sees we are most attracted to. The black man is the main reason the black woman isn't natural. I totally agree with you. And brothers, that's on us. And some of y'all letting your wife perm your daughter's hair at four and five years old. And black women, I don't know if y'all saw the news, the fibroid tumors, black women are 75% more likely to end up with fibroids, and they have now been undeniably connected to perm and weave. And guess what? I was in China. I was in China. Guess what I learned in China? Chinese women, they're not allowed to sell the relaxer they ship over here to Chinese women. And even the wigs and weaves that y'all wear have toxic chemicals in them that seep down into the blood-brain barrier, and that's why so many black women are coming up with brain cancer. We are literally killing ourselves to look like white people. Sister, go natural.
brother, go home tonight. Homework assignment, every black man. Go home tonight and cut your woman's hair off. If it's fake, bald her. Bald your queen. Get you some hot shea butter. Somebody selling some in the lobby. Get you some almond butter. Get you some coconut butter. Get you some shea butter. And rub that woman's scalp. Kiss her head. Pray to her head. And I promise you, by the summertime, she'll have a whole new forehead of natural hair. I'm telling you what I know. I was trained in barbering in high school. Make your woman go natural now, because black woman, let me tell you why most of y'all don't want to go natural. Because you got a lot of battle scars on your scalp. From all the years of weave, you got bald spots and ringworm and all kind of that. So what you got to do, <laughs> so listen, now listen, you can't get rid of ringworm unless you shave that hair. And, you, and you're not going to get rid of the bald spot until you cut it all off. Because y'all be gluing that stuff in your hair. That glue ain't made for human hair. It pulls your hairline back. You think Stephen A is pushed back. Half of y'all Stephen A. Okay? So, so you got to go bald and grow it all back. The longer you wait. Listen to me, black woman. I'm dead serious on this. Especially my sister's over 40. The longer you wait to cut it off and start new, the more difficult it's going to be because your hair thins as you age. My 20-year-old sisters, do it now while it's cold outside. You can wear an African head wrap. Okay, sisters, just head wrap it. Nobody got to know you bald. Put some little earrings on, head wrap. Nobody even know you bald. Do it now. It's February. You got the whole February, the whole March. April will start getting warm. You feel me? If you do it now, by the time April roll around, you will have what I got. <laughs> I love black people. Okay? I'm serious. That's all. See, some of y'all ain't going to listen. You're going to stay bald through the winter. And then when the summertime comes, you're going to have to weave and wig it out because you ain't getting no new growth. So black man, go to Walmart. All you need is the $20 clippers and bald her all the way down, some nice, some nice alcohol, a little ringworm a solution, pray on that head, and that's how you love a black woman. I loves me a black woman. I love butter almond. I love sweet brown sugar. I love hot butterscotch and warm peanut butter and chocolate fudge and African vanilla and inner city lemon. I love them all, brothers and sisters. In conclusion, listen, thank you, sister. God bless you, sister. You just brought up them damn horse eyelashes. Ladies, you are not a horse. The only thing with eyelashes with four inches is a horse. I'm tired of seeing sisters where the eyelash is like two pounds. It's so heavy that she walk around like she got a black eye. Stop covering your eyes up. Ladies, stop with the surgery. The tummy tucking is getting out of control. Let me give you, listen. If you got a 50-gallon head, <laughs> stay with me, queens, because all the brothers in here are going to get married one day. Brothers, I'm going to get married. I'm going to have two queens, though. That's another story. But listen. Listen! If you got a 50-gallon head, God made your body to match your head. So when a black woman go and get the, the weight loss surgery, and you come back with a 10-gallon body and a 50-gallon head, everybody going to know that's an artificial body. There's nothing worse than seeing a bullheaded black woman, a gallon head, in a pencil body. The head's so big, she needs crutches for her head. And listen, I'm going to confess, I dated a sister, 5'5", five, five, extra thick in the thighs. She got the weight loss surgery. 
Who told you to get the weight loss surgery? She went from the finest thing I ever seen to the hungriest looking thing. She said, can we go out? Yes, to all you can eat. Because your head needs some help. Brothers and sisters, I look forward to seeing all of you at 610 East 17th Street, either next month or in April. Uh, excuse me, this either this month or April. So it's either going to be the 25th for this month or it's going to be in April. Until then, call me. If you work at prison, if you work at a halfway house, if you work at a recovering addiction center, I don't charge to speak to those populations. So if you work with battered women, homeless men, recovery groups, juvenile detention, and you need somebody to come speak to those populations about what they're going through, I do that, and I don't charge for those populations. So if I can help you, let me know. I was born to help my people, not to take from them. Baltimore, I love you. Listen, if you are taking a picture or getting a book signed, if you are a woman, female, sisters, I want all the sisters to be in this line right here. We're going to do one line for the women and their children right here. Hotep. Oh, he, uh, go, go right ahead, Bob. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll repeat this question. Hold that thought, Baba, for one second. Okay, the sister line is right here. So the brother line is going to be in this aisle. All ladies come to this aisle. All ladies come to this aisle. Brothers are going to be right here. Biologically born, right here. Go ahead, Baba. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Baba. 